Lord be with you. We welcome you to worship this morning and welcome those of you watching us online. Next Sunday, there'll be one service at 1030, preceded by breakfast, and you bring your chair, and you have to bring your own coffee. But you bring your chair and your coffee, and you get your breakfast at the fellowship hall, and then go. we'll sit outside, which is almost a guarantee that it'll pour rain. But that's the plan, not the rain, but sitting outside. At the end of worship, there'll be a brief congregational meeting next week to elect uh, a person to be on the church nominating committee. So be thinking about who you'd like to see on the nominating committee. And then the week after that, two weeks from now, worship will be at Camp Greer. The only worship service locally will be recorded, so you can stay home and watch it on your TV or come to Camp Greer, where, we're, where we will have worship uh, under the pavilion. And those seem to be my only announcements, so let us prepare ourselves for worship. Stand if you're able and join me for the call to worship. Incline your ear and hear my words and apply your mind to my teaching. It will be pleasant if you keep them within you, if all of them are ready on your lips. So that your trust may be in the Lord, I have made them known to you today. The rich and poor have this in common. The Lord is the maker of them all. Let us worship God and let us pray together. Make your face to shine upon us, O God, and be pleased to dwell in our presence. We gather before you to give you our praise. Our ears have been opened to the sounds of angels singing hosannas. Our tongues have been loosed to shout, Alleluia, Amen. We listen attentively for your word, which brings wisdom. We wait expectantly to confess anew our allegiance and faith. Make your face to shine upon us, O God, and be pleased with our worship. Amen.
us continue our prayers and confess our sin. O oh God, giver of mercy, in Christ's name, hear us as we confess our sin. We speak when we should listen. We hesitate when we should act. Anger prevents us from working your righteousness. Selfishness inhibits our responding in faith. We are called to proclaim boldly the dawn of your kingdom, but our shouts turn out to be mere whispers. Cleanse us of wickedness and fill us with meekness. Redeem us in Christ, in whose name we pray. And faith in Jesus holds us and brings us forgiveness and hope. So believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen.
right, good morning. So our message today comes from Mark. And in this section of Mark is when Jesus heals a deaf man. And this man has been deaf since he was born. So not only can he not hear, he can't speak well either because he's never heard the sound of his own voice. But Jesus comes up to the man and he puts his hands on, on his ears, on the man's ears, and he says, be open. And his ears open up and he's no longer deaf. He can hear, but he can also speak well as well because he can finally hear his own voice. Now, I'm not deaf, and I know you two aren't deaf. You can hear just fine. So what is, what is, how can we use this in our lives today? Well, I don't know about you, but there's a lot of noise right now. People on social media, video games, TV, loud music, all sorts of things. And all of that together becomes so loud, it can be deafening to where we can't hear God's voice. So I'm going to encourage you this week to allow your ears to be opened so that you can hear God's still small voice among all the loud in the world today. So take some time when you get home and just sit in the quiet. I know that's hard for me, so I know it's going to be hard for y'all too, and that's okay. But just take that time to sit in the quiet and just listen. You might be surprised what you hear. All right? So today, if you're going to blast, Miss Margie is going to be heading down with you today right after our prayer. All right? So let us pray. Repeat after me. Dear God, Open our ears so that we may hear your voice speaking above all the noise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so we read from Mark 7, verses 24 through 37. From there he set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there, yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast a demon out of her daughter. He said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And then he said to her, for saying that, you may go, the demon has left your daughter. So she went home and found the child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon towards the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had an imp impediment in his speech and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in private, away from the crowd, and put his fingers into his ears and spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Epapha, which is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And then Jesus ordered them to tell no one. But the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. 
He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. This is the word of the Lord. Everybody loves puppies, right? Even Jesus loves puppies, it turns out. So the Syrophoenician woman comes to Jesus and asks him to cure her daughter's illness. Right away, there's a problem. She is a Syrophoenician. A what? Well, that word means just Gentile, but it specifically means that she's a Phoenician from the region of Syria, so Lebanon, in the area of Tyre and Sidon, two ancient Canaanite East Coast cities. She's a Gentile then. And Jesus encounters her there, which isn't really surprising. That's where she lives. You shouldn't be surprised to find Gentiles in a Gentile city. But he tells her he has come to bring the gospel, the good news, to the lost sheep of Israel, and not to the Gentiles, not to the dogs. That's what the Jews commonly call Gentiles. And she says cleverly, well, even the doggies eat the crumbs that fall from the table. And Jesus must have laughed. We don't see him laughing often because we've made him very serious. But Jesus had a sense of humor. There's a painting called Laughing Jesus. And I saw it once in a fellowship hall in Virginia. It was about six feet by six feet. It's a huge picture of Jesus' head thrown back laughing. The pastor said that ever since they hung that picture up, the tenor of the congregation had changed whenever they gathered in that fellowship hall. It was just hard for people to fight with this wonderful picture of Jesus laughing, hanging over them. So yes, I think he laughed and he said, you know what, she's healed. His basic mission though is to serve the people of Israel. He is their Messiah, but he has this larger concern for everybody. No one is left out and not even this dog of a Gentile. Now, this is simply stunning to be in the gospel. Mark includes it, and the early Jewish Christians must have wondered why. Jesus was theirs. He was for them, not for all these other people in the world, right? He's not the savior of the world. He's a Jewish Messiah. He's not the savior of the Gentiles. But here Jesus directly confronts this issue and comes down on the side of including everybody. Everybody is included in the good news of the gospel, not simply and only the Jews. Now God had called the Jews out of Egypt many years before. He gave them the law. He told them they would be his chosen people. They were special. They were different. They were the ones that God called and loved. Other people were left to their own devices. And now, this man who claims to be the Messiah from God has a different message. God loves all people, even these unwashed Gentiles. How could that be? The Jews would like to keep it separate, to keep their old ways and the old prejudices They want to preserve the law and the purity that it requires. They don't want to include these others, these sinners. Well, for for us, who are the Gentiles that we'd like to ignore? I mean, several groups come to mind immediately. I, I think blacks would be one of them. We we sometimes claim, but we aren't racist. We even have black friends. Well, good. That does miss the point, but good. We had a gentleman show up during worship at the first service, and he had a long story to tell about just getting out of prison and being sort of dumped in Newton. 
and told he couldn't leave the city limits. Then he was told that, well, he could go to Conover since there is no motel in Newton, but there is one in Conover. So we gave him some food and put him up in a motel for the night, and he says tomorrow he'll go see his new parole officer and he'll be fine, and I hope so. See, I'm sure that we wouldn't do anything overtly racist, but we live in a society that's built on that, based in that, so we have natural advantages over other people. And we move in society so confidently that I think sometimes it's hard to see the struggle that these other people have just to navigate society. So for us, they're just like Gentiles. Or, you know, the Gentiles could be the Arabs. And I use that word generically to mean Middle Eastern people, because they're certainly not all Arabs. After 9-11, there was a great fear of people who looked Middle Eastern. And I remember once I was flying away from Indianapolis for something. So I was waiting on the shuttle bus at the airport to take me to the airport itself. And there was a man there, nice man, nice looking man, suit, tie, briefcase, businessman. And he was probably from India or Pakistan or somewhere. He certainly wasn't really Middle Eastern. But it did make me nervous. I kept telling myself, yeah, it's fine. He's just a guy trying to live his life. He's not going to blow you up. He probably spoke good English. He probably only knew three words of his ancestral language. Or maybe he knew two or three languages. Who, you know, who knows? But... He looked vaguely Middle Eastern, and so he was a potential hijacker. That's what went through my mind. I'm sure he could tell. Well, we weren't hijacked, and we all went our separate ways. And, but we human beings are weird creatures, because we're always judging other people by how they look and what their customs are. And those who live in ways different from us we can just ignore. But my daughter Madeline reports that people are the same everywhere you go. And one spring, she'd come home, and she was waiting because she thought that they were going to hire her back to Perth, and she did go back. But while she was home, she got to know a local group in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And she went with them to Nepal, right after the earthquake they had in Nepal. And they hiked up to the top of some mountain, in some rural village, where the Youth with a Mission group was. And they found them sitting wrapped in blankets, waiting on someone to come rescue them. They were afraid to go back inside, because if an earthquake came again, the building would fall on their heads. And they got there and they said, what are you doing? Get up and start working. These people need you. They need to know that the world out there cares for them, that Jesus cares. So don't be afraid, get to work. And I guess they did. But you know, after something like that, earthquake or earthquake in Haiti, hurricane on the Gulf Coast, you know, every three weeks, People who live in places like here tend to say, well, why do people even live there? Why do they rebuild their houses again and again? Well, that's where they live. That's where they are from. Would you move away just because a tragedy comes every once in a while? I mean, you might. But most people, and especially the poor people, would just have to rebuild their houses and carry on. That's where they have roots and support. That's where they know people. So they might speak different languages and have different customs, but you know, really, people are just people. And all of them need the gospel. Now there's a writer named Kurt Anderson. 
And he says in one place that America is divided into two groups. There's the Dollar Tree store group, and there's the Whole Foods group. And, you know, he elaborates on that. And we don't have a Whole Foods around here. I'm sure some people wish we did. But I think Presbyterians as a whole would be in that group. We would be among the sophisticated, people who know how to live and who know what's what. And we would look down on others who, you know, go to the cheap store because they have to. So in short, we would be the Jews looking down on the Gentile dogs. Why would Jesus have any time for them? But you know he does. And here's the good news. It's no matter who you are, where you're from, what you've experienced, what you've done in life, what language you speak, he loves you. So no matter how badly you've treated someone sometime, he loves you. No matter what, Jesus loves you. And the woman knew that. She knew that Jesus would help her even if only a little bit, even if only a crumb, that would be enough. See, that would heal her daughter and bring them both into his circle. And she had this faith, and it amazed Jesus. He laughed with her, and he said, yes. She's joking, but her joke is serious. Even the dogs, even the people we don't like, they get the crumbs that fall from our table. And those crumbs are enough. And so the good news for us is, no matter how many times we ignore the others among us, or mistreat them, or don't even see them, Jesus still loves us. Thanks be to God. Amen.
us affirm our faith with these verses from Philippians. Christ Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess to the glory of God, Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. You may be seated. As we come to pray, let us remember Wanda Hicks. Her son, Carrie, was taken off of life's life support several days ago and died yesterday. And she will be in need of our prayers. I think she is at her daughter's house somewhere over around Raleigh, but we will see. Let us pray. We lift our prayers to you, O God, giving you thanks first and most of all for the life and ministry teaching of Jesus, who calls us to love all people as he himself loved all people and even us. We give you thanks for his life and death and resurrection and for the grace that we receive from him in that resurrection. And so always we bring to you our praise and worship. We give you thanks that you are with those who grieve. We pray that you will be with Wanda and her family, that you will stand by them and comfort them in their grief, and all the others whose grief is not so fresh, but just so painful. We pray that you'll be with those who are ill. We pray that you will comfort and care for those with COVID. And we pray that you will cure those who are in the hospital seeking other kinds of treatment or operations and that you will be with them. That you will bring the cure for all these people in the ways you know best. We pray for those who suffer and are mentally ill, just like that Gentile daughter so long ago. We pray that you will bring them healing, peace. And we pray, O oh God, for our country, for our leaders, in a world that is so divided by rhetoric and inflammatory conversation. We pray for peace. We pray for cool heads. We pray for the ability to listen. Give our leaders wisdom and courage and let them do what is best for all the people. We give you thanks for those who serve our country in difficult places overseas. And we pray for the Afghans and the, th that the war is over, we are glad. And yet we pray for the Afghani people that you will uh, be with them and help them as they seek to find a new government and seek to live in a new time. We pray for our friends in Guatemala where COVID is running rampant be with them and protect them, we pray. We pray for all of those whose lives have been flooded in the south and in the north. We pray for those whose lives have gone up in smoke out west. We pray for our world.
And we pray for your church in that world, that you will give your church courage and wisdom and strength to stand up for what is right, to do what is necessary, to bring the good news of your gospel to people everywhere, people who have heard it before and think they know it, and people who have never heard it and think they don't need it. Give your church the blessings and the gifts of your spirit. And hear us, O oh God, as we pray these and our unspoken prayers for the things that matter most personally to each of us. Hear us as we pray those prayers in Jesus' name. And hear us as we join our voices in the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Go in peace. Go and proclaim loudly the gospel to all those people out there that other people want to ignore and push away. Go and do that. And as you go, may all the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit go with you now and forever. Alleluia. <laughs>